Hello folks, it's a pleasure to see you today. My name is Dustin Cormier. This is How to Rock a Campfire. Today we're going to be continuing and extending our talk on Ganesha, particularly referring to Ganesha as the Lord of Synthesis and Astrology. So this is intended as part of my evolutionary script series. And really our, what we're getting down to here is discussing how Ganesha relates to the revolution of the nodes of the moon. It's Rahu and Ketu and the transiting eclipses. So closer to the latter part of this video, we're going to get into that. Now we're going to do a little review about Ganesha. Remember Ganeshwara? Uh, you know, I just recently did a video that has a real philosophical, flowing, informal depth describing what Ganesha is all about. Uh, I recommend you check that video out for the real guts on what's going on here. Uh, in this video, we're kind of scratching into a little bit more practical examples of what Ganesha is. So Ganesha, the Lord, Ishwara, the Lord of categories, obstacles, sound and light, and synthesis. It's the synthesis of Ga and Na. Ganesha is anciently associated with astrology, time, and the word, and writing. Uh, Ganesha is India's Buddha. Ganesha is India's Hermes Tresmegistus or Thoth. And there's a connection of these guys to Mercury, as I explained in our last video. Mercury is, its signs flank Cancer and Leo. Cancer and Leo are the throat chakra. Then after Leo is Virgo. Uh, sorry, it'd be this way. Uh, I'm flipped, so... <laughs> After Leo is Virgo, and before Cancer is Gemini. That's the throat chakra, right? So they flank the Ajna chakra. And then all the way down at the bottom is Capricorn and Aquarius. So from Cancer and Leo, we have Gemini and Virgo. And then, of course, we have Taurus and Libra at the heart chakra. So Gemini and Virgo kind of flank the crown chakra. And Mercury is also the closest planet to the sun. Mercury is Hermes, the winged messenger from the divine, coming into manifestation through the voice and through speaking. Now, of course, they mean different things, you know. Virgo is the extension of Leo. It's will going out. But Gemini is an extension of Cancer. It's the consciousness coming in. It's the spirit coming in. So there is a spirituality of the expression and merging of the heart because really cancer and leo also in some ways resonate with the heart chakra with the soul with the spirit coming into manifestation in a balance with our material life so as i say in our other video too you know it relates to buddhi which is clear reception of reality not just material reality, but our inner truth and bringing that into alignment with reality. What we say in Buddhism is that reality and the Buddha, your relationship, the spirit's relationship with this material plane is clear. This material plane is our karma. It's our cosmos. It's our sun coming to meet us. Our karma is an extension of us. But we all flinch at what reality gives us. We all have an emotion, we have a reaction to it. But the reality is Buddha. It's pure, clear, perfection. It's exactly what it's supposed to be. We just have to wipe the mirror, our muddy, you know, we have attachments to reality being a certain way. We have aversions to reality being a certain way. And that's of course in classical yoga, attachment and aversion are what keep us in samsara. But if we wipe the mirror, then reality will be exactly what it is, which is perfect in this moment. And this is how the buddhi, the true intelligence, r relates to Thoth, Hermes Trismegistus, the cr ch cracks in jade, as they say in the Western tradition. And Ganesha is the figure for this. So that's Ganesha as, you know, really kind of condensed there. Uh, I'm going to keep going forward with my presentation here because I don't want to get too uh, 
uh, informal, I guess you could say. So in this video, we're talking about the connection between Ganesha and modern astrology. There's an important spiritual metaphor in Ganesha's consciousness that saves astrologers from making a fatal mistake. And fatal, and there's a pun there related to fatalism. So now, underst let's understand, folks. Can you guys see me here? Good. Ganesha, Vishnu, Krishna, and Shiva. They're all names that ground our consciousness in the reality of Ishwara. So Ishwara is the experiencer. They all do the same job. They're all the same thing. But of course, the experiencer is wrapped up in Maya, the experience, through several dimensions at once although it's all one beingness beyond the veil of time and karma. We are all one, this one self experiencing all these different dimensions at the same time. That's why we have so many names for the experiencer, i.e. God, the eternal self. Each God represents a different circuit breaker back to the infinite. So this is they're all one. All is one beingness beyond the veil of time and karma. So Vishnu, Ganesha, Shiva, they all represent different power mantras that ground us in eternity and truth and reality. But they do it in different ways because we're all entangled. The experiencer, one, Ishvara, the Lord, our true selves, are wrapped up in the experience of life in many different ways. So all these different gods are different ways of grounding us back in the eternal. Vishnu kind of does it through love. Shiva kind of does it through absoluteness. And Ganesha is kind of a combination of those two in a certain way. All the different names of God and the power mantras associated with them represent different doorways to ground consciousness in the eternal. They're circuit breakers back to the infinite, beyond this particular moment and through this particular moment. So Vishnu and Shiva, are power. They, their power mantras take us beyond astrology. Let's into the causal body. Brahman, Atman, they take us into the, you know, beyond this present moment. But Ganesha works within astrology to synthesize this karmic moment with eternity. Ganesha is observing the astral body from the perspective of infinity, from the perspective of Vishnu and Shiva. And this is especially important for astrologers because this is what Ganesha does. Ganesha's message is that the karma of this moment will always be partly painful and partly blissful, but it'll always be necessary or else this moment wouldn't be happening. Reality is like a lover and it comes to you with a certain nature, with a certain form that it has to be. And you can't wish for your lover to be something different. You have to accept the love for what it is. That's how we have unconditional love for a lover. And that is how we experience the unconditional love of God. They are lucky and without obstruction who understand this. So we're going to be kind of waxing and waning on this th main theme in this video. Much of what you'll hear in this video comes from my own interpretations pulled together from my extensive reading. And much of it comes from intuitions garnered by my own relationship with the Ganesha Mantra. Now this is the Ganesha Mantra here. And we're going to explain a little bit about what it means. Essentially, Ganeshwara is a compound word containing three main components. It's Ga is the light, wisdom, destiny, dharma. Na, like Narayana, is sound. It's the heart. It's our feelings. And light and sound are two different things. You know, the, the, scene, the vision that we have is kind of more of a Mars sun nobility, whereas the sound we have is kind of a Jupiter moon feeling. And both of these need to be in a synthesis in the present moment. You know, Ga is kind of like our eternal Dharma, but Na 
you know, is like the moon. And that's why ga and na is yoga. You're combining the eternal with the present moment. And Ishwara of, is, of course, the Lord, like, like Ishvara. It is the overseer. It's us. We are the overseer of how we react to ga and na coming at us in different ways. We can't always necessarily have them both integrated. We are the leader. We are Indra. We are the one who has to say, as karma comes along, in this moment, I have to be in my heart. You know, when you're with a lover and they, you know, let's say you, you're depending on them to do something and, you know, you got to do this, honey, you know, and you're doing the sun thing and you're putting a lot of pressure on them without realizing that this is a lot of pressure on them. It might be difficult for them. There are times when it's not enough to tell reality what you want. Sometimes you have to ask, how are you doing, darling? Is this okay for you? Are you having a difficult time with this? You know, let's go slow. Let's go at a pace because reality has a pace. And our perpetual sun energy can only carve into reality at a certain pace. Just ask Saturn. <laughs> so Na is relating to our heart, our own feelings, and even our own need to have this pace of getting over the obstacles in life. Now, the Ganesha mantra contains this understanding, and this is why I like to share it. It's especially important for astrologers to take your time and move through this mantra. Ganapataye Namaha. We all know Aum is the Bij mantra of the cosmos and of everything containing all the three worlds in one. The signet of love, it's Vishnu's hand forever on the side of our heads calling us home. Gaum is sort of a bij mantra, a seed mantra that connects to wisdom and light. But Gaum also has a tripartite element of it. So it's kind of like, it says the same thing as Ganapatiye, but it's a bij mantra that gives this mantra more of a numerical rhythm to it. Aum, Gaum, Ganapataye, Namaha. Uh, sometimes mantras will do that. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, they're scaffolded with tones that relate to the totality. So Gaum is a bij mantra that's related more of this surrender. I surrender. So it's like Aum, I surrender to Ganapataye. And then Namaha is obeisance, respect. Ga is this wisdom of the light of the sun, and Na is the sound of the moon of this present moment, listening to this present moment. Pataye is, of course, us being on top of this synthesis and fusion. So Ganesha is this lord of synthesis and fusion in this way. So what's, let's dig into a bit more symbolism here. Like much symbolism, the elephant's head symbol is kind of multi-layered, uh, you know, and it does relate particularly to something in astrology. But I'd like to say it also relates to hatha. It relates to when you breathe, you can consciously synthesize the nadis that move to the left and right of the sashumna of the, of the body. When you are meditating in any way, the body contains its own, you know, if you've ever seen, th going through the chakras, there are two different nadis that loop each other like this before reaching the ajna. One goes to the right of the root, one goes to the left of the root. They meet at the svadhisthana, then they meet at the solar plexus, then they meet at the heart chakra, then they meet at the throat, then they meet at the ajna chakra right around the crown. And through breath, through concentration, there are ways of grounding our nervous system 
in the synthesis of spirit and the present moment. And this is like classic Kriya Yoga stuff. Uh, and this is one of the re meanings of the Ga and Na. The, in one sense, the phallic extended trunk of Ganesha represents awareness trickling from the third eye due to an extensive amount of focus and relaxation applied there. This is a lot of, again, the kind of stuff we do in Kriya Yoga. Oftentimes when I'm moving through my own Kriya Yoga meditations, I'll focus energy. We do something called Kriya Pranayama, where as we breathe in, we intone and we intone Om internally. And imagine the sound and light of Om is coming through all of the chakras, through the heart, the throat, all the way up to the crown. And once it's in the crown, you do this candy cane thing where the energy comes up to your third eye. And when you're focusing om, om, om coming through your third eye, eventually what happens is that you're imagining that there's almost like a phallic energy hanging from your third eye, like an elephant's trunk, like a, like a phallus. And this energy is just like in Tantra, it is kind of in a state of, there's a real Tantric symbolism here with the elephant's trunk coming through the third eye. What the heck? You guys know me if you know my channel thus far. In Tantra, you don't want to be, you don't want the man's phallus to be so excitable that it, it that it ejaculates. You want a steady halfway point of, you know, firm so that the experience of sexuality can happen as it is intended but the master of sexual energy doesn't ejaculate what they do is they, they allow the energy to circulate through in a constant state of not arriving or rather a constant state of always arriving and but also always leaving <laughs> this is the synthesis of ganesha there's a great poem uh I wish I could think of the, there's a, a poet from India who's a, a Shiva lover. She was a beautiful woman and she was known for just writing this great Shiva poetry. One of the poems she writes is she's talking about Shiva and she says, when I'm with you, it's almost, she's talking about her beloved Shiva. When I'm with you, Lord, it's almost too much. When I'm not with you, it's never enough. Oh Lord, when can I have it both ways, both being with you and not being with you? My Lord, white as jasmine. This makes me want to cry. I love the Indian mystic saints. So this is the synthesis that Ganesha represents, is this coming together of these opposites. And in terms of the third eye, the halfway point of being never arriving, but always being here. This is what's represented by the energy coming consciously from the root up to the crown and back down. Even the root and crown coming together relates to this Ganesha symbolism. So there's a lot to the metaphor of the elephant's trunk. And a lot of, there's a lot of yogic symbolism there. But relevant to this video, we're t t talking about synthesis. The elephant's head symbol simply means extension or continuum, similar to in Tantra, i.e. the elephant's head doesn't stop moving. Ganesha is the one that keeps infinity going through the word, through Mercury, through infinity. In India, it's said that when an elephant is moving forward due to musk, food, or fear, it will keep going no matter what until it gets what it seeks and nothing can stop it. Now, how does this relate to our practice of astrology? Well, astrology is about cycles and patterns. Many astrological significations relate to natal energies that must cyclically confront their opposites. If it's understood as an opportunity, these confrontations will never truly be an obstruction. They'll just be reality. They'll just be 
what your lover has brought to you in this moment. If you listen to your lover, if you trust your lover, then anything they bring to you is for a reason and is another way for you to love them. And reality, as our beloved, is in the same type of relationship with us. So we've talked a little bit about the what Ganeshwara is all about. Now, it's through Ganesha that the astrologer, and this is the key fatal mistake that astrologers can make, where, you know, it's sometimes astrologers, in the olden days, an astrologer had to play guru. Do I have a thing about that? Let me see. Yeah. The astrologer must be guru. So I'll kind of get there in a moment. But in the olden days, the astrologer would play guru. And the guru would be listening to Ganesha, to Mercury. And they would see, in all fairness, what is this person's karmic energy bringing them through. A lot of the times, our our karmic energy will bring us to, to things that are not right for us. You know, for example, the human consciousness, you know, if it gets into drugs or it's addicted to sex or if it's addicted to gambling, a guru can look at that and say, yeah, so you're lost in, right now in samsara really hard and you got to get out of that. That That's no good. That's That's trash. Come, bring yourself into focus. Everybody knows that this is not serving you. But the astrologer also has to listen, has to use na and say, why are you in this consciousness? You know, it's especially Western psychology has done a lot of good here. Indian teams tends to be very ga heavy, very light. You know, you idiot, this isn't serving you. Come on, let me be your guru and smack you around on the head. Come on, get out of this crap. That's not helping you. Western psychotherapy has a way of, you know, it's more of the Carl Jung. The therapist is sitting holding your hand and saying, I understand. You've had a difficult childhood. I understand. I'm with you. It would be very difficult to be going through this drug experience. Your sister's on drugs or something, or you're going through this experience, and I can see the pain in you. So a good astrologer should also have this na energy. Uh, but when a really... Somebody in that condition really shouldn't be coming to an astrologer anyway. They should be going to a psychotherapist who can, that, that they'll get more use out of a psychotherapist that way. An astrolo You're going to get the most use out of an astrologer by coming to them with karmas and difficulties that relate to necessary karmas that you have to move through that are specific to you. For example, if your mother's sick, your mother's sick and you've got some responsibility, you want to be a rock, we're going to talk about this, you know, if your mother's sick, this is a responsibility that you have to sit with that you're going to regret not being present with later on, if you choose to ignore it, if you choose to just get away from it. And a good astrologer will take your whole chart into consideration, considering everything that you got going on. And they'll listen to you. And a lot of the times they'll just tell you that this is a necessary karma. Your mother's sick or you're in school and you're struggling, but this is the reason why you went into school and it'll get you gains afterwards and you have to go through with it. You're in this relation, you're, you're lonely for some reason, but you're lonely because you're doing your dharma and it's worth it to do your dharma now. You go to school, you get your grade, and then it'll be easier for you to find love after. So you come to an astrologer and you can take best advantage of an astrologer by being present with what karma has unfolded for you, seeing it as a gift. Because again, as we've said, you know, I'm probably going to show this picture a few times. Ganesha's essential message is that the karma of this moment will always be partly painful and partly blissful. But it will always be necessary or else it wouldn't be happening. So, it's through Ganesha that the astrologer is reminded not to cheat the client out of necessary suffering that their soul is required to pursue right now in order to purify and liberate karma. It's especially significant with eclipses, Saturn transits, with difficult doshas, etc. We're going to kind of be talking about some of these practical examples in a moment. 
So Ganesha re- allows the astrologer to remind the, the and to not cheat the client out of necessary suffering. But it's also again through Ganesha that the client is reminded to listen to the joy and sorrow of this moment. And for the astrologer has to listen to the client to know even though they are going through a necessary karma, the astrologer has to listen to this person and really feel and allow it teach the person to feel their limits, to, to feel their honest personal limits and to meet the needs of the soul as it comes. This is balancing destiny, ga, with na, the sound, the heart, the moon, your honest personal limits. It's very important. Astrology must synthesize these dimensions of the heart in order to effectively keep a person on track with their dharma, their soul's purpose. Many come to astrology seeking answers to their problems. Many times those problems are exactly what they need to experience right now, although sometimes they're not. Again, drugs, gambling, you know, there's often examples where there's something happening in a person's life that's just not serving them. An astrologer has to know how to discern between these two. And more often than not, the astrologer just plays guru, invites the person to look within, to ponder why their unconscious has attracted this situation as a necessary karma that they are supposed to experience. This is one of the gifts of Vedic astrology is to understand karma often as a necessary thing to go through, not necessarily something to escape. Western astrologers get this too, but it's just nice that Indian astrology has the figure of Ganesha to ground this consciousness. Can you guys see me? Is that right? Yeah, just checking. So this is an example, you know, you're trying to be a rock star. You want to get further in your music career but let's say your mother is sick at some point you know there's going to be times where being this rock star you're gonna you're gonna lose some of your rock star sauce by hanging out with your dying mother and when you're hanging out with your dying mother you are you're gonna lose some of that rock stardom that you might have been wanting to go for at that moment uh but it doesn't mean you can't be in the hospital, you know, and instead of the example I gave is like, you know, you're in the hospital, you're beside your mother for, if you're that type of person who's there for days, you're banging your head against the, the hospital wall, praying and praying and praying that your mother gets better. There's a beauty there. But at that time, you could, there's ways where you could be constructive still. You could be practicing meditation. You could be practicing your guitar sitting beside your mother and writing little songs put your heart into the moment and maybe this is a moment for you where you can write some good painful music <laughs> you know the point is is that if you synthesize both of these the elephant will not stop moving if you recognize the importance of being with your sick mother at that moment already the, the elephant is not stopping moving this is an opportunity for you to exercise your heart and you know the, a lot of rock star types would choose instead to just go with their music and they will regret the necessary karma that they were supposed to be going through at that time. So life is full of these pulling and hauling moments. And that's why when we see an astrologer, it's moments like this that show an example of how depending on the individual person, each person is going to get the bliss of both sides of the heart in different ways in these situations. The karma of this moment will always be partly painful and partly blissful, right? Now, here's another example. You know, let's say you're lonely. You know, you're, you're not really taking as much time to experience being together with people as you would like. This could be a moment where you could pr practice working on yourself. Because life is going to give you a lover when it's supposed to give it to you. But if it's the, you know, a lonely looker never finds true love, as they say. This is a moment, if you're in this state of loneliness, this is a moment where you could be working on yourself, working on what you need, but also praying. If you're in a state of loneliness, pray to the universe and 
manifest through your words and through your prayer that I do seek to have a lover that is right for me. But let not my will be done, but thine alone. O Lord, O universe, O my beloved lover that is reality. Put your prayers out there. But when reality is giving you, you know, it's like there's a Zen poem that says, the woodcarver walks through the forest and he knows the image in his head of what he wants to carve out of the wood. So he walks, he can walk for days, he can walk for weeks, walking around in this forest before he finally finds the right one. This is the piece of wood that is going to be my masterpiece. Now, if he's walking around and he picks anything that is not the right one, you know, it's like, let's say he wants to create a bust of a woman or a man or a, the, a, a figure of some sort. He has to find the right piece of wood that's bent in the way where he can see his vision before he carves it. If he picks the wrong one along the way, then he's not going to create his ultimate masterpiece. And he has faith that the wood is coming to him, just like he is going to it. This is the nature of finding love and is similar in this way too, is having faith that the universe is going to bring it to you. And don't let the elephant's head stop moving. Continue to what you can do for yourself along the way. Put out your prayers and trust that it's coming to you. Now, these are examples of how to deal with this Ganesha consciousness, of how to deal when life is giving you dual opposites that you need to synthesize. Now, let's look into some practical astrological stuff here. This is the natal moon's nodes are a primary key for understanding this. And of course, we could also say at this moment, you know, it's the same thing with Saturn transits to its own natal points, but also to any points, uh, especially Saturn going through Sarisati when Saturn transits the moon, conjuncts the moon. Uh, when you're going through a difficult Dasha period, you know, everything that you see on my evolutionary script video are examples of things that can happen that cause necessary karma that we have to deal with. Uh, but it's especially, I like to give the example of Saturn transits as well as node transits and the new moon. You know, here's a little example of how the new moon, when people talk about the new moon, an example of how it can be understood. You know, the new moon was, was very vague for me for a long time and still I you know, I've been practicing astrology for a while and it's coming to me the meaning of it because a lot of people talk about it to be, well, I digress. This is my idea of the new moon and what it's about. And it's in these cycles. Remember, uh, as we were kind of saying here, astrology is about cycles and patterns. Many astrological significations relate to natal energies that must cyclically confront their opposites. The natal moon's nodes are a true primary key for understanding this. So there are three ways of understanding how uh, Ganesha can be applied in cyclical transits. These are the three strongest concrete examples I can give. There's the transiting nodes and eclipses themselves. They bring significant karma to the natal nodes. So the transiting nodes to the natal nodes squares, conjunctions, and oppositions. Now there's also the transiting new moon in relation to the natal nodes. There's also the transiting new moon in relation to the transiting nodes and eclipses. So those are three different things. And I'm going to show you guys little examples here. And later on, I'm going to go into more detail about this. The transiting nodes. So this is the eclipses, right? We can see here, this would be your natal Rahu, for example, and your natal Ketu. Now, I've got this circle and it almost looks like Rahu is in the 10th house, but really this could be any Rahu in any position. You're going to see the example of my Rahu. Now, let's say the north node is transiting. Uh, let's say you're 18 years old and or you're 36. That's when we have our nodal return. So the north node has come to transit back to where it is natally. Of course, the nodes move backwards in the chart. 
And wherever the nodes are, there's going to be an eclipse there that year. That's what's signified there. So wherever the node is in these transiting, the transit of these quadrants, it's going to mean something different. You know, you can check out my node transit uh, quadrants video because I'm going to go more into detail about this stuff. But just to give an example, this is Dustin's natal chart. As we can see here, I'm a Leo rising. I have K2 in the sign of Cancer. And I have the North Node in the sign of Capricorn. Now, this year in particular, there is the transiting nodes are transiting in the signs of Aries and Libra, which means when there is a new moon in the sign of Aries, they are going to come together right at the critical point where the moon, astronomically it's hard to explain, but the moon is moving, the moon is like a rabbit and it goes north and south in its transits throughout the month, basically. Every month it's either southward or northward. So the point, the conjunction where the moon and the sun are together with the earth is where the eclipses happen. So that's what the North Node in transit is. It's the place where the eclipses are going to happen. And the South Node is the same. It's just uh, the other side of the eclipses. This year of 2024, the North Node is in Aries, which means there was an eclipse in April. The South Node is in Libra, which means there will be eclipses in October. Now, where the sun and moon are having their eclipses this year is square to my natal nodes, right? My natal node, my south node is in Cancer, my north node is in Capricorn. This year, there are eclipses happening in Aries and Libra. So there's a square happening there. And we can see how this is essentially you know, as time goes on, the North Node is going backwards, and the North Node is going to move into Pisces. Then the North Node is going to move into Aquarius, especially the North Node eclipses that show a direction of karma moving forward. So right now, just so you guys can understand these quadrants, my the North Node in transit is between C and D. It's been at... It's been close to K2. Now the North Node is in Aries for me, for, for all of us. And Aries is square to my natal nodes. As time goes on, the North Node's going to be in Quadrant D. The North Node's going to be in Pisces. Then it's going to be in Aquarius. Then it's going to be in Capricorn eventually, uh, about four years down the road when I'm 36. When it's in Quadrant D, it's a certain consciousness. It's in Ra. The North Node is in Rahu land. That's where my karma will be going. And again, you can check out more on my uh, natal transit, natal nodes and transiting nodes video. But this is an example. This is one example of where the nodes move very slowly. And as they move through these quadrants, this is this is going to bring certain karma. Right now, the North Node is moving towards Rahu. When the North Node is moving towards Rahu, that means I'm dealing with significant Rahu karma. And I have to accept that. To be honest with you, I'm actually very excited about it. It's usually more fun when Rahu is going towards Rahu. When the North Node is moving towards your natal North Node, that's why at the age of 36, there's always great things that come out of it. Uh, but eventually, the North Node has to move towards K it, K2, your natal K2. When the North Node is moving towards your natal K2, you have to deal with K2 karma, which is your roots, which is necessary things that you got to do. Rahu is always the more exciting one. K2 is like this fortress that you've always existed in. And there's good karma to be done with K2 as well. Rahu is a lot of fun because it brings out things that you've never enjoyed or experienced in your life. When you're younger, Rahu is more fun. When you get older, K2 is actually the more satisfying experience. I'm giving you guys some clues how to understand this stuff. And again, 
I'll be doing videos talking about the lunar nodes and the new moon in transit as relates to this. You know, but the point here is, is that whether your north node is closer to your natal Rahu or whether the transiting north node and eclipses are closer to your natal K2. In either way, this is an example where you have to just be present with the karma and with the direction that is in front of you and moving towards you. And this will especially be, you know, this is tricky if, for example, you have a difficult situation happening with your Rahu. If you've got Rahu conjunct the sun, if you've got Rahu conjunct the moon, if you've got Rahu agitating a certain planet by being in the same sign as it, or if your Rahu Lord is in a difficult place. You know, one of the reasons I'm excited about my the North Node coming towards my Rahu is because I have a good Saturn. I have Rahu and Capricorn, and Saturn is in its own sign of Aquarius. So when the North Node comes towards that point, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy there. There's a lot of good that happens there. Even though it's still Rahu, it's still Saturn, can still be painful. It's kind of what side my bread is buttered at some level. Uh, so this is an example where the eclipses are going to be putting pressure on an arena of my chart that is set up for success. Although it's still pressure, there's going to be painful karmas associated with it. I'm going to have to let go of a lot. It's still going to be painful. But an astrologer, if an astrologer saw me struggling in this period, they'd probably say, this struggle is really good for you. You're expanding, you're growing through Saturn, you're growing into your Rahu in a very profound way. And once the North Node goes past that peak point, you're, gonna, you're not going to be in this window of growth anymore. So be in this window of growth. Take the most advantage of it that you can. And this is, of course, a four and a half it, the, the nodes represent an 18-year cycle. The nodes go around every 18 years, they come back to their point. So when the north node is moving towards a certain important point in your astrology chart, it's a short window, it's comparatively speaking, but it's an important window. Just like if Saturn is going over an important part in your chart, putting pressure there. An astrologer will tell you that as painful as it is, if it's set up for success, it's necessary karma. If it's not set up for success, it's probably still necessary karma because Saturn's got to go through there at some point. The eclipses have got to go through there at some point. So take it easy on yourself, but recognize that the, the things happening to you at this moment are necessary, whether they're good or bad. And everyone's always going to have good and bad in the chart, right? This is how we have to understand astrology. Now, the transiting new moon has similar things, similar cyclical karma, except that of course the new moon goes around once a year. So here again is Dustin's natal chart. Now where the nodes represent, you know, the nodes could be in a place like they've been, the, the nodes are going to stay in Aries for about a year. And then they're going to come into this side of my chart, which it'll be there for four years. And it'll be another four years before, finally, before it finally gets away from my natal Rahu. And then it'll go into K2 land. So that's like a that's like an eight-year process. The new moon is a one-year process. This happens in one year. Now, this month, the new moon just fall uh, happened in the sign of Leo. So I'm still in the time of year because the new moon is happening in Leo. That's a new month, a new tone to this month. Now, this is obviously in the second house from my natal K2. So this month is still in K2 land. This is what happens to me every year. From Aries season in April, then there's a new moon in May, there's a new moon in June, there's a new moon in July, there's a new moon in August, there's a new moon in September, and there's a new moon in October. So every year from about April to October, I'm dealing with K2 karma. Then from October all the way to April, I'm dealing with Rahu karma. Of course, for me in the summer solstice, uh, I'm usually experiencing a specific 
intense K2 karma. I'm dealing with roots. I've got K2 in Cancer. So I'm usually dealing with family in the summer solstice, tuning back into my heart. It's when, when the new moon moves towards Christmas time that I'm usually in a very industrial mode, dealing with family, dealing with my psychology, building my life and building necessary roots for me. But that's because Capricorn is an earth sign in its own way. It's ruled by Saturn. Saturn is a very rooted planet in its own way, but it's also progressive. So when the new moon moves towards Rahu every year, I shift. I'm in a different place. I'm in more of a workhorse, getting out of my heart and moving into Saturnian progression. And this happens to me every year. Now, of course, there's also the new moon transits in relation to the currently transiting eclipses. So the eclipses are the most transformative points of the astrological year. It's like a karmic tar pit. It's sucking all, all events towards it. So this is the obvious example here. So this, this month, the new moon is transiting in Leo again, right? Now we're showing, you can see my natal nodes here. Now, where are the transiting nodes? Well, of course, the nodes are transiting in Aries in Libra. Now, right now, the new moon happening in Leo means that the whole world is in K2 land. In fact, this particular pocket from Cancer to Libra is doubly K2 vibing for me at this time because my natal K2 is close to the new moon and the new moon is moving towards transiting K2. Because the transiting south node is in Libra right now. In October, there's going to be an eclipse in Libra. And the new moons right now that happen in Leo, in Virgo, they're moving towards, it's like they're getting sucked into that karmic tar pit, right? The karmic tar pit of the eclipse that's going to happen in Libra this year. So now the whole world is moving towards this K2 energy. Now, this is interesting to note that this, this month, the new moon falls into Leo, which is a trine to the Aries eclipse. You know, if you watch people, like there's a, a really good lady named Susan, Susan Hop, Hodgkinson uh, who does work where she's talking about how new, the new moon is falling at a point that's in a close trine or square to other points, to other transits that have happened. And this can happen in a lot of ways, you know. Even the new moon, for example, happening in Leo is going to be opposite the point in Aquarius where Pluto is. And it's also going to be opposite where, for example, uh, when Jupiter and Saturn recently came together. They call it the Great Conjunction that came together at the first degrees of Aquarius. The new moon in Leo is opposite to that point and is reverberating it and having a conversation with it. So that's a whole fun side of transit astrology. Uh, our point here is to show that the new moon is going to be in conversation not only with your natal nodes, but also with the transiting nodes. The new moon in Leo is now past the square to the transiting nodes and is in south node territory. We are now all in the time of year where the new moon is moving into the area of the transiting south node. Now each of these transits represents a certain place in a cycle. We're each embedded in several evolutionary narratives at the same time, like these concentric circles. Thankfully, these cycles are smaller to bigger. So if you track them, you can feel them. You can feel each of these cycles. You can feel the yearly cycle of the new moon moving closer or farther from your natal nodes. And that's something that's always going to be the case. Wherever the transiting eclipses are happening, I am always going to feel K2 energy when the new moon goes from Aries, then the new moon happens in Taurus, then the new moon happens in Gemini. The new moon then happens in, in Cancer in the sum, around the summer solstice. It's so around summer solstice. I'm always going to be full of K2 energy because I have my natal 
south node, K2, is in the sign of Cancer. That's an experience that I always am going to have, and that's part of my karma. I always have to integrate that as part of my Ganesha energy. And again, when summer solstice happens, it's intensely K2 for me. It's often very busy, lots of summer stuff. And K2 being in Cancer for me, it can be hard for me to really bond with people deeply. But summer solstice forces me, everyone's out in summer and enjoying their lives. It's often a time where, for example, I'm in a band. It's my Rahu and Capricorn wants to make an industrial advantage by getting my band together and playing on stage at some big summer concert. And I feel a lot of Rahu energy there, but K2 is forcing me to also enjoy it to bring my friends there, not just to treat it like an industrial Capricorn expansion of my career, but for me to integrate K2 and bring my family, bring my friends, come everybody and see me do this band thing. And that's an integration so that the elephant's head keeps moving. This is the synthesis of the two nodes. I have to deal with that whenever my new moon is close to the sign of cancer and I also have to deal with this type of energy whenever my new moon whenever the new moon is close to my Rahu and Capricorn your natal nodes you know check your own natal nodes and start tracking for yourself the new moon is happening in Leo and if you've got the north node let's say in Virgo that means that you've been in you know ever since the sign of Gemini, ever since the new moon happened in June, you've been moving to the new moons have been moving towards your north node in Virgo. Now the north the new moons are happening in Leo and it's moving towards your north node. You're in north node land. You're in a productive exploratory dimension of your annual new moon charts. So there's the natal node and the new moon's transits of it. Uh, so there's your natal node, rather, and there's the transiting eclipses in relation to that point, which is an 18-year cycle. Then there's the new moon in relation to your personal north node and south node. And finally, there is the new moon in relation to the transiting eclipses that we all experience. Remember, again, the south node is currently in Libra. We are all going to be experiencing an eclipse in Libra in October. Right now it's only August, and we're moving into that karmic point, like a karmic tar pit, like a suck hole. And events are happening now that are already building up that point. We're going to deal with the karma related to the south node in Libra, all the planets there, all the planets in our natal chart that are in that area. So this is how we have to understand these things, that we're all in all of these concentric circles of cycles. But if you start paying attention to them now, as time goes on, you're going to see your relationship. You're going to start to note the patterns and understand them so that when life presents you through these nodes, through this karma, through a Saturn transit, when life presents you with a necessary karma, you're like, ah, yes, this happens every year. This happens every year. You know, if Saturn moves towards my south node in Cancer, it's going to feel like that whole time Saturn's in Cancer, I'm going to be dealing with energy related to what always happens to me during summer solstice. Industrial Capricorn things blended and merged with family, personal emotional survival. So when Saturn is in Cancer, I've got to deal with that. And I'm going to know what to expect. And I'm going to know what's good there, but also what's excessive there. Because I've been watching those patterns go through. And I've been praying to Ganesha. Whenever those moments happen, I accept the karma and I look for the truth of the reality. So I can go on forever about this, but I hope that it's clear the, just what I'm painting, the picture I'm painting in terms of how to observe reality as a lover, as a gift from the divine cosmos for exactly what's needed in this moment or else it wouldn't be this thing.
that's where Ganesha comes into play. The karma of this moment will always be partly painful and partly blissful. But this is how the sun, the sun has to experience its infinite heart, what it always seeks. The moon has to go around and light up the full moon of every single sign in order to complete the embodied worldly embodiment of what the sun the heart inside the sun seeks to do and we have to be patient as we go from new moon to full moon new moon to full moon and the full moon slowly makes its way around we have to listen just as much as we have to try and shine our light out the ga the dharma we also have to listen to our hearts in this moment of what we need, what our body needs, what our emotions need, what our soul needs. In order, the silver of the soul is what holds the gold of the spirit, like a silver earring that has a golden orb inside of it. Silver is a perfect alloy for the gold of the spirit. The silver of cancer is the moon. The moon has to hold, has to be malleable, and we have to listen through the silver in order for the gold to be held and to be supported. And this is what Ganesha teaches us. This is the synthesis of ha and tha, sun and moon. And this is the whole message of this video. Remember that no matter where you are in the circle, remember the center. The elephant's head will keep moving and you'll never feel obstructed. It's impossible to be obstructed when your consciousness is grounded in eternity. Now, I hope that's clear. It's very important for everybody to understand. You know, it's deep, but if astrology wasn't deep, then it wouldn't be real. If astrology wasn't complex, that it wouldn't accurately reflect the complexity of man. But man has all this complexity, but when you look at the top of it, it is all, there are simple, basic truths. And the Ganesha, the figure of Ganesha as the Lord of astrology and the word is a very important thing to understand in order to effectively, as a client, prepare the way so that an astrologer can do their work they can cut to the chase and tell you what's you know what they think is happening and that you can receive it of course this also takes your faith in what's happening and you got to be careful because lots of astrologers think that they know exactly what's going on with you but they should also listen so not only is ganesha the synthesis of now and the eternal, good for the client. But it's also very important for the astrologer to understand that they have an idea of the Dharma that you're going through, but they have to speak with you. They have to counsel you. They have to hear what you can take and can't take and what you should take and shouldn't take while reminding you of what your Dharma is, what your purpose is and what your truth is, but also reminding you to listen to yourself, your intuition, is at some level, you are the final arbiter of what's the right decision to make. A guru can only guide you, but you have to, you know, the guru can lead your horse to water, but it's up to you where you want to drink, what you want to drink, when you want to drink. So keep all these things in mind as you move through your astrology practice as a client and as an astrological practitioner. I'm very happy and honored to have shared the principle of Ganesha with everybody here today. If you really want to get the most out of the Ganesha mantra, I suggest you meditate practice some pranayama, and then do the Ganesha mantra out loud nine times. Then you'd whisper it. To get into the subtler dimension of consciousness, 
do that whisper nine times. Then the subtlest level of consciousness. You internalize it. Do that nine times. Then you sit, you contemplate. Then you go to your astrologer. Talk with your astrologer. Write down, contemplate, reflect on what you see happening. Listen within. And always see that the present moment is an extension and expression of the eternal. And there will always be an answer to how to deal with this moment appropriately. The key is to recognize that life and reality love you. They're alive. The cosmos is alive and it's trying to be in conversation with you. And if you can take these moments to meditate, and to trust that the word of God is made in the image of God and the light of truth that you are seeking, it is seeking you. If only you will listen. If only you will be patient. If only you will observe and clear that mirror. Clear your emotional expectation. Clear your attachment. Clear your aversion so you can be a vessel for receiving consciousness, self-realization, and the truth of your reality. We could easily go deep into the abstractions involved here, but I feel good about leaving that there. I'm Dustin Cormier, folks. This has been our video today on Ganesha synthesis and astrology. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned because in our evolutionary script series, we're going to go into a little bit more depth into all these different pieces of the evolutionary script. Stay tuned, folks. God bless. Thanks for listening and watching. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time.